rolling. I can say at the beginning it was about getting work and earn something. But as I was more involved with the case karma, it was not just uh, earning something and get something for my kids. It was more of a skill because I didn't know that I have this skill with me. So I was developing and developing each and every year. I have, I, I find myself develop, developing, doing more things that I, I didn't know that I can do with my hands. Also, the part of uh, going away, maybe to go to East London, to go to Cape Town, it was not the thing that was in my mind because I'm the mother, I have to take care of my kids each and every day. So with the case gamma, it's very easy because we start at nine. You wake up very in the morning at, at least uh, five o'clock and prepare your kids for school, for everything, and you prepare for them when they come after school, you are not there at, at home because we pass off at four o'clock. So it was a very easy life, you know, to be with the case karma, earning something and also at the same time being with your kids each and every day. So that the thing that hooked me down and said, no, we're not going anywhere, just stay here. Yo, case gamma art projects, it, it means a lot to me. Uh, I've traveled the world. I've been in London. Soon in 2012, I was in Germany. I spent three months in Germany. So when I look at the books and uh, read those books that uh, are written, there is a German book also that I have at home that was written after we were there. When I look and see my name on that book, and then I think of someone else who is like far away, maybe in Paris or wherever, who is looking at that book and say, oh, there was Veronica Bethany from South Africa who visited Germany. So it's something to us, you know. Though we say sometimes, well, we are artists, but we are poor, you know, but there is an indication that there is this project here happening. Yeah. It makes me very proud. And then it teaches my, my kids that there is a, this huge thing of unemployment. So you can't sit and just fold your arms and say, no, I'm, I'm, an, I'm unemployed. Because at home, I've got my work that I'm doing. I'm doing like a cushion covers in a patchwork. I saw some bags at home. I do a bit work at home. So I'm sort of like feeling to transfer that skill to them, not to sit down and say, no, I'm unemployed. I will run around and ask and beg for something from other people. I'm not that kind of person who like begging and stuff. It's, it's very powerful um, to take control of that, you know, and be able to do that with your own hands, to make your living from your own hands. I used to say to them, there are people that, that 
they don't have hands. They want to do something. There are people that they don't have feet to walk, but they want to, to, to walk, but they can't. They don't have feet to walk. We are, we are gifted. We've got our brains, our hands, our feet to walk around. So how come we will sit down and say, no, I'm looking for someone else to feed me? No ways. Um, what opportunities would you like for your children and your grandchildren? I think, uh, especially where at this time that Unonelela is doing grade 12, I wish she can go to the college or the university. But I can't afford the university, but the college she can go with. And also my last born. Uh, Sibonello. She seems like uh, getting there with her books because I saw the teachers when I was uh, at school there. They look at her report and they say, wow, you did well. So my wishes for her is to not to come here in Hamburg to school because that school that is she, she is attending now is a high grade school. So I want to keep her there. And sometimes I think of uh, taking her to the girls' school, yes, where she can stay there with another girls, like a boarding school. So yeah, not to be involved in the outside world, to read everything that is done by the others. So I want her to be in the boarding school until she passed grade 12. That's my wish for her. This artwork uh, is about HIV and AIDS. Yeah. The large Guernica was made in 2010. Do you think people's attitudes and understanding of HIV AIDS has changed since 2010 to today in 2017? It has changed. It has changed. When I look uh, in the community here, and also if you go to public hospitals, because at first there was that, that tendency of uh, isolating people that are having HIV and AIDS. But now we are in a queue, not knowing that you are going for TB, you are going for HIV, you are going for diabetes, you are going for what? We are in the same queue. But at first they were like isolating those people, say people are, that are coming for HIV must stand on the queue. People that are coming for TB must stand on this one. So people, when they come in, they say, okay, I'm not in that queue. I'm on TB one, I'm on diabetic one. So for now, when you go to hospitals, we are all coming to the hospital, not knowing what for. It's only your folder that is talking to you that, okay, I'm coming to the hospital because of this. And also the dying of people is not uh, like that huge amount that we were having before. And also to talk about it. People at first, they just say that thing, not saying HIV. They, they used to use that term or say of saying that thing, you know. But now we can sit and chat about it because we say, HIV is not like a diabetic, because if you have a diabetic, you go to insulin and have, you have to inject yourself, which is the worst part. If you have a diabetic, you have uh, your low diabetic, you have your high diabetic, you don't know what to do. But with, with HIV now, you got that one pill that uh, collects all those three that they used to take. You just take one at night, which is fine for you. Not like people that are living with diabetic that can die any time because if it's high, it's, it's a risk. If it's low, it's a risk. But with HIV, you just eat normally, you eat uh, healthy, you are fine, and then you take your medication. <laughs>